Well, good morning. We're so thankful to be with you this morning, Zeal Church. I need some Zeal merch, I think. What do you think, Brad? I think we need some. Yes. Anyways, today we're just so thankful to be with you. We're so thankful to Pastor Terry and Sherry for allowing us to share our hearts with you today. And we know that God has given us a word to share with you. And the Lord has worked that word in our hearts. And we pray that we encourage you today to take a step of faith. I think you guys are already a faith, faith-filled faith bunch. Amen. I, I see that today, that you are... The Lord is working incredible things in this church, and I praise the Lord for you. I mean, wow, this, really, this is an incredible church. So thank you so much, Pastor Terry, for the honor to share God's word with you today and what God is doing in Japan. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for Zeal Church. Lord, I thank you for the leadership of this church, Lord, and I thank you especially for Pastor Terry and Sherry, Lord, and their beautiful family, Lord. I pray a blessing over them, and I pray a blessing over Zeal Church as they minister to Hermiston, to Stanfield, to Umatilla, to the greater area here in Eastern Oregon, Lord. We pray a blessing over them as your Holy Spirit leads them into this new season, Jesus, that you would open doors that that have not been opened yet. Lord, that those who are broken would find healing, that those who are chained would be set free in the name of Jesus. We believe great things are coming. Great things have happened, but yet great things are yet to come. And we pray a blessing over them in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you want to follow along with me and Brad this morning, we're going to be sharing from Matthew chapter 14. And to save some time, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background because I think maybe some of you are getting hangry already. Or you know what I'm talking about? Like hang, like hungry and angry. I don't know. I get hangry if I don't eat every few hours. So I want to make this short and sweet for you today. But today we're going to talk to you about taking a step of faith and how Jesus calls us to take a step of faith. So Jesus was um, in chapter 14. He had just heard the news that his cousin John the Baptist was murdered by King Herod. And like any of us, if we heard that someone that we loved had recently passed, we would probably want to be alone to grieve and to cry and just to cry out to God. And so he wanted to get away by himself in a boat. But yet the people heard where he was was going and guessed and went ahead of him there. And so despite Jesus' pain, he thought, I'm going to heal these people. I'm going to touch them. So that's what he did. He healed the blind. He touched the sick. And you know, the people, they got hungry. They were hangry like I get and like Brad get after a few hours. And, you know, it wasn't like back in the day where we could go to Starbucks and get something quick or go, you know, to McDonald's. They were out somewhere really far away. And so this is where Jesus had to do the incredible miracle of feeding the 5,000 with just a few loaves of fish, or excuse me, a few loaves of bread and a, and a few fish. And so this was an incredible miracle. So real quick, I'm going to read from you from chapter uh, Matthew 14, 22, and it says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. Take courage, I'm here. Then Peter called out to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come out to the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong and the wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. So living a life of faith requires us out of our comfort zone. It requires us out of, into places of discomfort. In our text today, we see that the disciples, they were terrified. They thought that they saw a mirage or a ghost, but it was really Jesus. And Jesus was walking on the water. And this was an incredible miracle. And what was even more incredible is that Peter said, hey, Jesus, if it's really you, 
call me out to you. And Peter did something else that no one else has ever done except for Jesus, and he walked out onto the water. So I have a question for you. Has anyone ever tried to walk on water before? Raise your hand real high if you have. Okay, a few people have. So if you're new to church, that's awesome. We're so glad you're here. But I grew up going to church, and I would hear this story when I was little, and I was like, hey, Jesus, like, can you hook me up? I, like, want to walk on the water with, like you did. And I would, like, every time there was, like, a pool or every time there was a lake, you know, I would try to, like, step out on the water. But what happened every time? I would sink. So maybe someday Jesus might let me do that, but not yet. Anyway, so Peter is one person that has walked on the water just like Jesus did. So Peter decided to follow Jesus. He decided to get out of the comforts of the boat and to step out in faith. Verses 29 and 30 say this. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind in the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. It's implied here that Peter had his eyes focused on Jesus before he got distracted. Zeal Church, our eyes always have to be focused on Jesus. Nothing but Jesus, especially when we take a step of faith. So three years ago, my family and I, we got um, our 14 pieces of luggage because I had to have like my Cheez-Its and my Reese's peanut butter cups, you know, all the things from Target, my Starbucks coffee, whatever, and of course some clothes, you know, minor details. But we got on an airplane to go to Japan for the very first time. And all of a sudden, I was sitting on this airplane on the tarmac, and I was like, Jesus, what did we just get ourselves into? Are you sure that I can do this with my three small kids and my husband? And once we got to Japan, I realized, wow, I really feel like a fish out of water. I could not even speak Japanese. I could barely say, hajimimashite. And people would say, oh, your Japanese is so good. They were so sweet. Everything was so overwhelming in the beginning. And everything felt so dark. We would walk on the street and we would see idols everywhere. We would see, we would see Shinto shrines. We would see Buddhist, Buddhist temples everywhere that they could fit it, you know, on a little corner of a street, like maybe this big. And every neighborhood, every home has Shinto shrines or, or a Buddhist temple and I, in their home. And I thought, God, are you sure you've called us? This place is so dark. How can anyone be reached here? But did you know that God loves all people, that he loves all nations, that he loves all tongues, that he loves us, and that he has a great plan and purpose for our lives through Jesus Christ, to know him and to be saved by him. And so we started, we started learning Japanese, which is one of the hardest languages for a native English speaker to learn. We started building relationships and slowly but surely we were able to share the gospel in small ways and then in bigger ways. We had to become a student of the customs and the culture. We had to learn how to become a good neighbor and when it was appropriate to talk to someone because Japanese people are so reserved. And if I was my really loud and American self, I would totally offend them. And so we had to humble ourselves and ask for the Holy Spirit to show us how and when to share the good news. Japan is, um, is very resistant to the gospel, and so we had to really be led by the Spirit. But now, after living in Japan for three years and eating all the sushi, does anyone like sushi? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. We're with good people. Um, but anyways, despite that, you know, eating the sushi, eat, loving the culture, God has given us a love for the people. And we're so thankful that God has called us where he wants us to be. Did you know, Zeal Church, that when God calls you to do something, he gives you a love for the people. He gives you his heart for your community, for your neighborhood, where God has called you to be at. Those are the people. That's your neighborhood. Those are the people that he's called you to reach out to. So wherever you are, wherever God places you, whether it's here in Hermiston or the other side of the world, you can be a minister of the gospel. You can share the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus always calls out, calls us to step out of places of discomfort because he is worth it. And the people who he loves are worthy to hear the good news. So living a life of faith requires us to, to leave what is comfortable, but it also requires us into something called the unknown. It requires us to go places where we have never been before. 
So I don't know about you, but I love Peter. He's my favorite in all of the gospels and all of the Bible. Anyone else love Peter? I love him because he's just so real. One day he's like, Jesus, I will live for you. I will die for you. And then the next thing we know, he's like denying Jesus three times over. Like he was just so honest and so real. And I just relate to him a little bit too much, especially his impulsiveness, if I'm being honest. But anyways, Peter, Peter was used by God to do an incredible miracle. And he did something no one else had ever done before. And so we, we, can, we can be used by God in that way too. So I have a question for you. Has anyone ever seen the Sister Act movies? Okay, so if you, know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, these are the movies from the 90s with Whoopi Goldberg. And anyways, basically what you need to know is that there's gospel music. So, and, and in Japan, they love gospel music and they still love these, mu- these movies because Japan's kind of behind on their pop culture. So anyways, these movies, these music, this music is really popular still. So I had no idea, Zeal Church, when I went to Japan that I, oh, can you hear me? That I would have to join a gospel choir. And I don't even sing like, like, thank God Alex was leading us today because you not want me to do that. But anyways, God has a sense of humor and he can use us if we say yes to him. So at my very first gospel choir practice, I met a lady named Emiko. And Emiko told me the very first time I met her, Ro, I'm thinking about becoming a Christian, but I'm not sure yet. And this was about maybe two years ago now. And so she had told me that she was thinking about becoming a Christian, but you know, here in America, we don't really think about becoming a Christian. Like, if we, if we say yes to Jesus, like, it's pretty quick. But in Japan, they can take years to say yes to Jesus. Despite that, Emiko, she wanted to become a Christian, but she was not ready yet because she wasn't sure if her husband would deny her. She would lose her adult children if maybe she might even lose her job for saying yes to Jesus because being a Christian in Japan is like being a part of a cult. It's a really strange, it's very foreign idea to them. But anyways, Emiko decided to keep coming to our church. She kept coming to the gospel choir. And even when the pandemic, the pandemic hit, she would say, hey, can I just like sit in the back as you do your Facebook Live? I just want to be there because the Holy Spirit was guiding her there. He was leading her there. So over time, we kept saying, hey, are you ready to say yes to Jesus? And she would say, no, I'm not ready. But finally this year in March, on a random Sunday, she said, I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. And praise the Lord. You have a new sister in Christ. (laughs) Praise the Lord. And she is your sister in Christ. And that is why you sent us to Japan, to the never reached in in Japan, so that people would say yes to Jesus. So Emiko is now our sister in Christ, and she has started intense discipleship classes. And she is so excited to be learning about Jesus. It might take a long time for a Japanese person to say yes to Jesus, but once they say yes, they're all in. They are on fire for Jesus. And what a transformation it has been. So for Emiko, it was a step of faith to say yes to Jesus. It was out of comfort. It was out of discomfort to say yes to Jesus, but she did it. So I don't know if there's someone here today that needs to say yes to Jesus, but I want to tell you, it is worth it. Jesus is always worth it. And whether God is calling you maybe to go across the street to tell your neighbor about Jesus, or maybe it's to to go tell your coworker, at work about Jesus, but maybe you're scared about how they're going to receive that. Follow Jesus. He will always guide you. He will give you the words if you ask him. He will be faithful to you. Maybe it's to continue to give generously to your church or maybe to start giving. Whatever it is, whether it's to go across the street or to go across the world, God always calls us to places of discomfort because following him is always worth it and it will always be worth it because he is worthy. Thank you so much. Sometimes when we take a step of faith, um, failure happens. Let's just be honest about that. Failure can happen. 
I'm trying to find my place here. There we go. All right. Uh, as, a, as a follower in Christ, sometimes failure happens. As a human being, sometimes failure happens. How many of you know what I'm talking about today? Yeah, you've experienced failure before in your life. Yeah. Uh, Peter definitely uh, tried and he failed. He was walking out there on the water and uh, he got distracted. He, he started looking away from Jesus and he began to sink. But what I love about this is Jesus was right there to grab his hand and to pick him up. And church, I want you to know that whatever you're going through today, Jesus is right there to pick you up. There is no failure that's so big that Jesus can't grab you. There's nothing that you can do, no sin so big. Jesus is right there with you. In fact, I love the way that Hebrews puts it. He says, Jesus uh, will never leave you and he will never forsake you. Jesus is always right there to pick you up. Sometimes failures happen in, in different ways. And uh, as, a, as a missionary, sometimes we kind of uh, get that experience in our lives. Um, in fact, uh, many a time, uh, failure happens to us. It can be something small like misunderstanding language. Someone says something to me and I don't understand what they're saying. It could be me trying to communicate something and I use the wrong word and um, I say something that I totally didn't mean to say. Uh, it could be trying to go to the bank to set up a bank account and things just happen. It's hard living in another culture. It's not easy, but failure happens. But you know what? Jesus is always right there to help us through it. Um, I think uh, we need to kind of shift how we think about failure in our lives sometimes. Um, because sometimes when God calls us to things, he's not calling us to results. He's calling us to faithfulness. So when God puts something in your heart to do, the measure of success is not by human standards, but is by our obedience to Jesus. So if God's calling you and you say, yes, you are successful. After all, I don't save anybody. I have never saved anybody. I did not die on the cross to save somebody from their sins. I did not pay the penalty for anybody else's sin. I don't even pay the penalty for my own sin. Instead, it's Jesus who saves. It's Jesus who calls me to share his good news. And in my obedience, I am successful. I may not ever lead a single person to Jesus, but if I am obedient to what he wants me to do, I am successful. And the same goes for you. I don't know why I'm talking about me. This is for you. <laughs> Trying to encourage myself today or something. I don't know. Oliver's uh, we, living overseas for multiple years. You go through the cycles of birthdays and holidays and all those kinds of things. Oliver had a birthday one year. Every year he had a birthday, but one particular year I want to talk about uh, he requested spaghetti and meatballs and a special cake uh, for his birthday meal. And we're happy to oblige. So we go to the store. We buy all the things, the meat, the eggs, the oil, the seasonings, uh, cocoa powder, uh, all the things that you need. And uh, so uh, I get up in the morning and I roll out some, I mix up and roll out some meatballs and life is good. And Rose starts mixing up the cake and throws it in our little toaster oven because that's the only oven we have bakes for 45 minutes. She takes it out and it's still batter. The cake didn't set. I touch the oven, burn my hand. I'm like, oh, that's not the oven. It's, it's hot. And uh, so she comes to me. She says, I don't know what happened, Brad. Can you help me? And so I'm like, sure, I'll help you. So we go through all the ingredients. We mix them a second time. And uh, uh, we're very careful measuring everything, getting everything just right. We mix it up, throw it in the oven, take it out. And again, cake batter. I'm like, I, I don't understand what's going on here, but we're just going to keep trying until we get this cake to set, right? So uh, the third time, we, we get the cake all mixed up, very carefully measured everything, put it in the oven. Meanwhile, I, I start heating some oil on the stove. I get a, a meatball. I grab one. I put it in the oil, and uh, I'm expecting a sizzle because that's what happens when you put meat into hot oil like that, and uh, nothing happened. I thought to myself, well, maybe the oil is not hot. I don't know. Uh, so I just waited a few more minutes, and uh, I, I, nothing was happening. So finally it dawns on me, there's something wrong with this oil. So I go over to the jar of oil. I dip my finger in it. And how many of you have ever tasted something you don't expect? It was soap. 
we were trying to mix a cake with soap and we failed. But, you know, we were able to go to the store, buy some oil. We looked up the, the Japanese word for oil so we knew what we were looking for. And uh, we got it all taken care of. And Oliver had a birthday cake that year. Ah, oh, doggone it. I lost the iPad. I lost my notes here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, I, I didn't expect that to work. Okay. Uh, so we, we baked the cake and it all is good. But sometimes, uh, you know, we just need to keep trying until we until we get the, the result that we're looking for. Um, but uh, sometimes when we're living a life of faith, failure happens. And we just need to know that Jesus is right there to pick us up. He is there to walk us through and to carry us on and to, to keep us going. Uh, the next thing I want to share with you, and this is kind of the last point that I have here, is when you're living a life of faith, God is revealed to people around you. Now check this out, check this out. So Peter, when, they, when Peter and Jesus got back into the boat, by the way, when Peter got back into the boat, he was the only one who was wet because he's the only one who tried. So Peter and Jesus get back into the boat and the next thing that happens is the disciples gather around and they begin to worship Jesus saying, surely he is the son of God. I looked this up because I got curious about it, and it turns out this is the first time that Jesus was worshipped with those words, surely you are the Son of God. And what's important about this is that the disciples recognized because Peter took a step of faith. So Jesus was walking on the water, and they didn't know what was happening. They didn't know if he was a ghost. They could have dismissed Jesus as a ghost. They could have dismissed Jesus as a figment of their imagination. We collectively imagined this. But when Peter stepped out onto the water, they began to realize something. You know what? That has to be Jesus out there. And Jesus has to be the son of God because there's no way that Peter can walk on the water by himself. So when Peter took that step of faith, he was revealing that Jesus is the son of God to the disciples around him. And when you take a step of faith, you have an opportunity to share Jesus with people around you. When you take a step of faith and miraculous things begin happening around you, the only explanation is it's my God who loves me, who cares for me, who is delivering these results for me. When we, uh, our, our time in Japan, our last three years that we were there, we saw two people come to know Jesus. And I thank God every day for those two people. Because somebody took a step of faith to start a church, to invite people to church. God was revealed to these people and they were able to be saved. Same thing goes for this church. Many years ago, somebody started this church and they said, people are going to come to know Jesus through this church. And countless lives have been touched because somebody took a step of faith and started this church. And so uh, the Peter... Uh, we, uh, someone took a step of faith, started our church in Japan, and uh, in the last three years, two people got saved. And I know it's easy to look at that and to dismiss two people. Because here in America, uh, Pastor Terry could preach a sermon about just about anything, and at the end, give a call for salvation, and people are going to raise their hands. But in Japan, they don't come to know the Christ by the tens or by the hundreds or by the thousands. They come one by one, by one. And we pray and we long for the day when people will begin to come to know the Lord by the tens and then by the hundreds and then by the thousands. We believe that that day is coming and we ask you to pray with us for that day to come. But we've had two people come to know the Lord. Rose shared one of them. The other one came because she was a co-worker of one of our church members. And our church member didn't even invite her to church. She just saw that there was something different about her, her co-worker and she said, I want that. It must be that church thing. And so she goes online. She looks up our church, finds when and where we meet, and just shows up uninvited. And let me tell you something. We love uninvited guests in church, don't we? She shows up uninvited. And that day, she gave her life to Christ. Thank you, church, for sending us so that people could come to know Christ. When you take a step of faith, God is revealed to those around you. And uh, uh, 
I, I just want to impress that upon you. Uh, maybe God's calling you to a step of faith today. And uh, I want to pray for you at the end that God would give you everything you need to take that step of faith. But I can't uh, be a good missionary unless I share with you some things about Japan uh, that are important about working in Japan. Um, but uh, it, in Japan, uh, like I said, you know, we, we don't pray for revival in Japan. We pray for spiritual awakening. And the reason is because to pray for revival is to assume that there was already something alive that can be revived. Instead, we pray for spiritual awakening. Japan is what we call a never reach people group. And that means that less than 1% of the Japanese people are Christian. And if you are, if you don't, if you are not a Christian, the odds are uh, that you may have never met a Christian. You may have never seen a Bible or held one. You may have never been inside of a church. And uh, uh, yeah, you may have never even met a Christian. So th that's the reality that we live in. These people have no concept of who Jesus is. It's, it's crazy to think about that because here the Bible has just so permeated our culture uh, in some ways that you could say like David and Goliath. You know, people know whether they're Christian or not that we're talking about a big versus a little here. And uh, in Japan, I preach from one scripture because if I use multiple scriptures, if I refer back to David and Goliath, then they're like, what does that mean? And I have to go back and tell that whole story of David and Goliath and all the context. Uh, even, in, even in church, even with church people, we have to do this. And so I stick with just one scripture uh, just to make it easy and uh, that I can be able to, to speak in the amount of time that I'm given. Um, but Japan is, uh, right now we have more Assemblies of God churches, we have pastors to pastor those churches. So some pastors are pastoring multiple churches. Some churches are just operating without a pastor and uh, rotating members are speaking. I mean, there's just all kinds of scenarios that are out there of how these churches are, are going on. And so when we go back to Japan, what we're looking to do is to, we're going to pastor the church that we served in for one year, uh, interim pastor. And then after that, we're going to partner with another Japanese Assemblies of God church. We're going to help create discipleship programs so that if people feel called to the ministry, that they might be able to have enough biblical knowledge to have the things that they need just to be able to go be trained to be a pastor. There's a gap between your average Japanese church member's uh, biblical knowledge and, their, and what you would need to go into Bible college. And so we want to help uh, close that gap and help people be able to do that. So uh, we pray every day uh, for Japan, Matthew chapter 9, verses 38 and 39, where Jesus is talking with his disciples and he says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send his workers into the field. And we, we pray for national workers, for God to raise up Japanese people to minister to the Japanese people. And we pray for international workers, for people from America, from Australia, from Italy, wherever they want to come from, to come and to minister the gospel in Japan. And so I have this uh, QR code that's going to pop up here in a moment um, behind me. And uh, we ask every church that we minister in, would you be willing to do three things for us? Number one, would you pray for us? Pray for the gospel to go forth. Pray for more workers. Pray for the people of Japan to come to know Jesus. The second thing is to give. You can, give, you can use this QR code if you'd like to. You can commit to pray for us. Uh, you can also use it to give to us if you want to. But the, bit, the best thing for you to do is to give your missions dollars here at Zeal Church to your missions program here. That way, it's not just me who benefits, but all over the world, the gospel can go forward. And the last thing is, would you consider joining? And Pastor Terry already mentioned how, he, how he's praying that someone would feel the call of God to another nation today. And if that's you, you can scan this QR code. It'll take you uh, the other one. You can click on the join one. There's one that says pray, one that says give, and one that says uh, 
join. You can click on the one that says join, and that will uh, take you to another web page where you can look at opportunities all over the world uh, to uh, see uh, where the Lord might lead you. And so if, if you're interested in that, and then you can also find our socials and our newsletter sign up on there too. So um, I want to pray for you. Uh, and uh, then the worship team is going to come, and they're going to close us out uh, with a song today. I want to pray for you in Japanese first, and then uh, in English. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Kamisama, kansha shimas, anata no namai wa ichibanu wei no namai des. Anata no mikotoba o kurete arigatou gozaimas. Shinko no jinsei o ikite tetsudate kudasai. Eyasu no suburashi min namai ni yotte. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are here among us today. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, I, 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 I pray that right now, Lord, as we are contemplating living a life of faith, Lord, that somebody here is feeling your leading to take a step of faith. And God, I don't know what that step is. Maybe it's uh, something in their personal life. Maybe it's something that they're going to begin to pray for. Maybe it's, um, uh, some, uh, s s maybe you're calling them to start a ministry. Maybe you're calling someone to go overseas. God, whatever it is that you're putting in people's hearts to take a step of faith today, God, I ask that you would give them the courage, the bonus, the wisdom, everything they need from you to take that step, oh God. Lord, may we walk confidently in your spirit. May we know that you are guiding and directing our every step, oh God. And Lord, if we fail, that you are there to pick us up. And God, that our failure, uh, that our success is found in our obedience, Jesus. Lord, I, I pray a blessing over Zeal Church God, I pray that as they're beginning this new step, this new journey, Lord, that you would uh, uh, cause them to have a tremendous effect in their community, oh God. Lord, that you would move tremendously in the city of Hermiston and the surrounding area, oh God. We love you, Jesus. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Amen. Amen.